Hello everyone. Today ang ayong third meeting natin sa series na Postmodernism and its Children. So ngayon, we will talk about queer theory. Uh, as a disclaimer, ang series natin ay nag-heavily rely sa book ni Helen Pluckerls and James Lindsay entitled Cynical Series, How Activist Scholarship Made Everything About Race, Gender, and Identity, and Why This Harms Everybody. Dito ko mismo kinuha yung pag-explain ko ng views that we will talk about. What we will do first is we will talk about queer theory in general, its historical context, and also expound on the views of its main proponents. Second, we will give a critique based from the Christian worldview. Well, let's start the queer theory in general. Ang queer theory ay liberation daw from the norms of gender and sexuality. Ang reason dito is because ang categories daw sa gender, sex, and sexuality are oppressive. Dahil ang queer theory ay directly derived from postmodernism, radically skeptical ito of categories na may kinalaman sa biological reality. Ang tingin nila sa mga categories na ito as ways of talking about certain issues. Ang assumption ng queer theory ay ang oppression ay nag-follow from categorization, kung saan ay makikita ito when language makes a sense of what should be deemed as normal. Ang example nito ay pag produce and maintain daw ng rigid na categories of sex, such as male and female, gender, such as masculine and feminine, at sexuality, such as straight, gay, lesbian, bisexual, and more. And also, making people agree sa narrative na ito. Ang mga concepts na ito ay seen as oppressive or violent, and the main objective ng queer theory is to examine, question, and subvert ang mga categories na ito para masira sila. A way ni love doing this is to rely sa postmodern knowledge principle by rejecting a possibility of attaining objective reality. The postmodern na political principle, where the society is seen as structured in unjust systems that na reinforce and perpetuate ng kanilang sarili. Ang reliance sa dalawang principles na ito satisfies ang ultimate purpose ng queer theory, which is to identify and make visible how ang linguistic categories create suppression para ma-disrupt ang mga ito. Dahil dito, ang queer theory manifests ang postmodern scene about sa power ng language, which is that ang language ay gumagawa ng categories. Ina-enforce nila ito, which makes people unwittingly submit dito, and also ang boundaries are seen as arbitrary and oppressive. And para mawala ito, ay they will blur the boundaries by showing na absurd ito. Ang queer theory ay considered by Pluckrose and Lindsay as influential sa iba pang mas recent na applied forms ng postmodernism, which includes gender studies, trans activism, disability studies, at fat studies. Historical background. Now that we are able to give a general overview ng queer theory, let's now proceed in talking about a brief history ng queer theory. Ang queer theory... Ayon kay Pluckrose and Lindsay, ay nag-grow out daw of the radical groups na nag-revolutionize ng feminist, gay, and lesbian studies at sa related na activism noong 1960s. Ang civil rights movements ay nakatulong din for people to be interested to study homosexuality and kung paano ito, paano ito categorized and stigmatized historically and in their present time. Ang queer theory then ay deeply influenced ng AIDS crisis ng 1980s kasi this made gay rights issues an urgent social and political concern. Sa queer theory, we can see how people's view of sexuality have changed. Throughout Christian history, I see ng homosexuality as a heinous na sin. If compared daw ito with the ancient Greek culture, we can see na acceptable sa kanila for men to have sex with adolescent boys until ready na sila mag-marry. Pagkasal na kasi sila, they're expected to switch to have sex with women. Though homosexuality daw nun ay regarded as something that people did and not seen as their identity or who they are. Ang idea around na ang isang tao could be a homosexual ay narecognized lang noong 19th century. And nag-appear ito for sa medical text at sa mga homosexual na subcultures. Ang contemporary na medical text view homosexuality as a perversion and ang public perception ng homosexuals ay slowly nag-shift dahil sa rise ng sexology at the end of the 19th century. By the middle ng 20th century, ay ang homosexuals ay regarded na less as corrupt na degenerates na kailangan parusahan pero sila na ay deemed na as disordered individuals na nag-require ng psychiatric treatment. 
Over sa second half ng 20th century, nag-shift ang discourse sa homosexuality at ito ang considered to have the moral high ground today. Ito ang attitude na best summed up as some people are gay. Get over it. Dahil ang queer theory ay isang applied na postmodern theory din ang universal na liberal idea na nag-affirm ng common humanity natin over a specific na demographic identity ay considered as problematic. Problem daw ng LGBT na categories ay stable at hindi regarded ang categories na ito as social constructs na built ng mga powerful to dominate and oppress. Ayon sa kanila Pluckerus and Lindsay, Though may dramatic changes sa pag-regard natin ng homosexuality over the last century and a half, ang understanding ng natin ng sex and gender ay hindi masyado nagbago. Generally, ay we have always understood ng species natin ay may two sexes at ang gender ay mostly correlated with sex. Ang gender roles do ay considerably nagbago. Most daw kasi sa Christian history ay ang men ay associated sa public sphere and the mind or sapiensya at ang women naman ay sa private sphere and sa body or sciencia. And ito ang nag sa analogies like men are to women as culture is to nature. Ang women ay considered na suited daw for subservient, domestic, at nurturing roles. At ang men ay sa leadership, public engagement, at assertive na managerial roles. Ang mga attitude na ito, which are referred as biological essentialism, ay nagrepresent daw sa culture at large until the end ng 19th century. Nag-start ito mag dahil sa feminist thought and activism. Dahil nag-falter ang biological essentialism, ay kailangan na ng clarity sa distinction between sex and gender. Ang word daw na gender ay hindi used to describe humans until the 20th century. Ang ibang language ay walang ibang comparable na word. Ang idea raw ng gender seems to have always been with us. Ang sex is to gender ay as man is to manly or woman is to womanly. Dahil dito, Gender seems to have always been understood as correlated with but distinct from sex. Kapag ang sentence na siya ay isang masculine na woman ay nag-make sense sa'yo, then you are already distinguishing yung sex as a biological category from gender, which are behaviors and traits na mas nag-manifest sa isang sex. Ang history daw ay puno ng examples ng mga tao na nag-refer sa manly and womanly or masculine and feminine. However, may profound na change na nangyari raw dahil sa second wave feminism sa West sa latter half ng 20th century. Ito raw kasi ang time na ang mga babae ay nagkaroon daw ng control sa reproductive function nila and rights na ma-access lahat ng jobs and also ay na mabayaran sila the same as men for the same work. Dahil dito ay ang mga babae makikita na raw in every profession and they experience few legal, legal or cultural barriers to be part of it. Ang similar na changes ay nag-result daw sa gay rights and sa pride and trans rights movements at ito raw ay nagtanggal din ng legal and cultural barriers for the LGBT people. Even though most daw ng changes ay result ng pag-recognize ng biological roots ng sex, gender, and sexuality, at ang attitudes na involve ay classically liberal and individualist, ay deemed ito as evidence sa social constructedness ng gender and sexuality ng mga queer theorists. Dahil ang queer theorists ay naniniwala na ang sex, gender, at sexuality ay social constructions na mainly dependent ito sa prevailing na culture, ay hindi sila ganun ka-concerned sa material progress or sila ay concerned more sa dominant discourses na nag-enforce ng categories tulad ng male, female at gay. Ang mga scholars and activists daw ay rightly concerned about sa cultural na power dynamics na nag-come along pag considered na true ang mga categories na yun. And based sa context na ito, nag-rise ang queer theory. Ngayon na we are able to talk about yung historical background ng queer theory, we will now proceed to talk about yung views ng founders or main proponents nito, which are sila Gail Rubin, Judith Bossler, and Eve, Eve Kosovsky Sedgwick. Sila ay mainly nag sa work ni Michel Foucault at sa concept niya of biopower, which talks about the power ng scientific discourses. What we will do ngayon is to expound first sa concept ni Foucault of biopower. After this, I will expound sa views nila Gail Rubin, Judith Bossler, and Eve Kosovsky Sedgwick. 
kung understanding ng oppressive na rule ng science can be traced kay Michel Foucault. Inaal ni Foucault ang production ng power knowledge or how knowledge ay socially constructed ng discourses. Ang particular na concern niya ay ang biopower, which is how biological sciences legitimize ang knowledge na ginagamit ng mga tao in power para i-maintain ang kanilang dominance. Sa four-volume study ni Foucault na The History of Sexuality, ay ina-argue niya na since the late 17th century, ay far from suppressing speech about sex, which is contrary sa arguments ng neo-Marxists like Marcuse, na merong explosion sa talk about sex, which includes ang act mismo at ang biological concept. Habang nag-categorize at nag-aral ang mga scientists, ay sabi ni Foucault na they simultaneously constructed it at sila ay gumawa ng sexual identities at categories na nag-accompany ng mga constructions na ito. Ang sabi ni Foucault sa History of Sexuality, quote, the, the society that emerged in the 19th century, bourgeois, capitalist, or industrial society, call it what you will, did not confront sex with a fundamental refusal of recognition. On the contrary, it put into operation an entire machinery for producing true discourses concerning it. End quote. Unifoco was that ang discourses ay produced ng machinery in question at ang discourses na ito gained social legitimacy as truths at ito ay nagpermeate sa lahat ng levels ng society. Ito raw ay process of power. Pero hindi ito same sa Marxist notion where religious or secular authorities impose their ideology sa common people. Rather, para kay Foucault ay ang power ay nag-operate more like a grid kung saan ay nag-run ito sa lahat ng layers ng society and it determines what people regards as true and how people talk about it. Ang view na ito asserts ng power ay isang system kung saan tayo ay constantly nag-participate sa pamamagitan ng manner in how we talk about things and kung ano ang mga ideas na willing tayo i-consider as legitimate. Ang system na ito ay where we are culturally embedded. Ang main culprit daw sa paglegitimize ng knowledge and power ay ang science and itong reason bakit may prestige ito sa society. Foucault refers to this as biopower which claims ng scientific discourse ang nagdikta bilang supreme authority at in the name ng biological and historical urgency ay genostify nito ang racisms ng state dahil they grounded ang racisms na ito in truths. Ang power na ito ay nag through the whole system ng society at they perpetuate themselves through powerful na discourses. Ito ang tinatawag ni Foucault na omnipresence of power. Now that we are able to expound a bit about biopower ni Foucault, let us expound some views ni Gail Rubin, Judith Bosler, and Eve kosovsky sedgwick Let's start kay Gail Rubin. Sa 1984 essay niya na Sinking Sex, ay nag-argue siya ng mga bagay na we consider as good sex and bad sex ay socially constructed ng various groups at discourses about sexuality. Dahil sa concept ni Foucault on the social construction ng sexuality na nag-start noong 19th century, ay she became deeply skeptical of any biological studies on sex and sexuality. Ang essay niya made a foundational na contribution sa queer theory sa pag-reject ng sexual essentialism, which is, a, which is an idea na ang sex ay isang natural force na nag-exist prior sa social life at ito ay nag-shape ng institutions. Ang sabi ni Rubin sa Thinking Sex, quote, It is impossible to think with any clarity about the politics of race or gender as long as these are thought of as biological entities rather than as social constructs. Similarly, sexuality is impervious to political analysis as long as it is primarily conceived as a biological phenomenon or an aspect of individual psychology. End quote. Ang assertion dito ni Rubin ay dapat you should believe ng sex, gender, and sexuality should be seen as social constructs para ma mas maging madali for us to politicize them and demand change compared sa pag ito ay biological. Compared kay Foucault na makita as a cynical reading ng history ng sexuality bilang descriptive of what has been and is, ang kay Rubin daw ay plainly ready to make an ought ahead of what is. Feature raw ito ng applied na postmodernism and this undermines public trust academy na considered as the guardian of what is and makes it more like a church na nag-convey of what people ought to think and believe. Ang agenda-driven na view na ito ay nasa heart ng queer theory 
It goes against the rigor ng scientific inquiry and sa ethics ng universal na classical liberal na activism para sa gender and LGBT equality. Ang liberalism kasi does not require for one to believe ng gender at sexuality ay socially constructed in order to argue na walang justification tayo for discriminating against anyone. Ang position ni Rubin sa thinking sex ay, quote, Concepts of sexual oppression have been lodged within that more biological understanding of sexuality. It is often easier to fall back on the notion of a natural libido subjected to inhumane repression than to reformulate concepts of sexual injustice within a more constructivist framework. But it is essential that we do so. End quote. Si Rubin ay nag-insist na crucial for us to reject biology and fully embrace ang idea na ang sex at sexuality ay constructed sa isang unjust na hierarchy kahit she recognizes na mas madali for people to accept na ang different sexualities ay nag-exist naturally and some of them ay unfairly na discriminated against. Ang thinking sex ni Rubin ay nagbigay ng early indication ng development ng intersectionality at ng rejection ng contemporary forms ng radical na feminism. Sa pag-describe ni Rubin ng hierarchy ng sexuality, ay we can see Rubin saying na ang ganitong klase ng sexual morality daw ay mas maraming mga bagay na in common sa ideologies ng racism and that it grants virtue sa dominant groups and hindi sa mga underprivileged. Na-recognize ni Rubin na ang sex ay nag-perpetuate ng oppression. Para kay Rubin, ang radical na constructivism and focus sa discourses on sex ay essential para sa liberation ng mga tao. Nang sexuality at gender identity nila ay hindi cisgendered, gender-conforming at heterosexual. Ang pag-dismiss sa biology at sa explanations nito on sexuality and gender identity ay considered as a political necessity. At justified ito through a moral relativism about sexuality. Thus, we see sa queer theory a rejection ng science, a rejection ng classical liberalism, and also a rejection ng feminism kung saan ay niregard nito ang women na oppressed ng men and they instead prioritize queerness. Next, si Judith Butler. So, ngayon, tapos na tayo kay Gil Rubin. Proceed na tayo kay Judith Butler. Si Butler considered nila Pluckers and Lindsay as the most influential queer series na nag about queerness. Isa siyang American na philosopher na influence ng French feminist thought at nag siya sa postmodernism, especially sa work ni Foucault at ni Derrida. Ang chief na contribution ni Butler sa queer theory ay ang pag-question niya sa links between sex, which is ang biological categories ng male at female, at gender, which is ang behaviors and traits na commonly associated and also sexuality, which is ang nature ng sexual desire. Noong 1990s, si Butler uh, ay allergic sa any traces ng biological essentialism. Siya ay nag-argue extensively ng gender and sex ay distinct at na walang necessary correlation between the two. Para kay Butler, ang gender ay socially constructed. She did this by employing ang well-known niya na concept which is ang gender performativity. Ang complicated na idea niya na ito ay makikita sa 1993 work niya na Bodies That Matter on the Discursive Limits of Sex. Ito raw ay power ng discourse na magproduce ng phenomena na pwede nito ma-regulate at constrain. Or in other words, I brought into being, placed into meaningful categories, at made real by behaviors at expectations na naka-encode sa speech. Makita rito ang postmodern political principle na nakuha from Foucault at ang related na theme ng power of language. Ang gender performativity is not something that we should think of like a stage performance dahil ito ay derived from a branch of linguistics. Ang isang male actor could perform a female stage role and remain to believe na siya ay isang man. Hindi ito ang sense ng performative ayon kay Butler dahil ito ay mag-require ng pre-existing na identity by which ang isang act or attribute ay pwede ma-measure dahil ito ay hindi nag-exist para kay Butler. Instead, ang sabi niya sa gender trouble, feminism, and subversion of identity ay that ang gender roles ay sought and learned, often unwittingly through socialization, 
bilang isang set of actions, behaviors, manners, and expectations. At ang mga ito ay ginagawang rules na ito accordingly. Ang gender para kay Butler ay isang set of things na ginagawa ng isang tao and hindi ito something na based sa kanilang identity. Ang society ang nag-endorse sa mga actions na ito and associate ang mga ito with linguistic use like male or manly kaya naging real ang rules na ito through gender performativity. Para kay Butler, dahil sa malaki na social pressures at normativity ng gender rules, ay ang mga tao ay hirap na ma-perform ang gender nila correctly. They play out a rehearsed script and dahil dito ay they end up in playing the social reality na they call as gender. Ang Vinnie Butler ay ang tao ay hindi pinanganak as someone na alam nila na male sila, female or straight or gay. And dahil dito ay hindi sila nag-act in accordance to any innate na factors. Instead, ay socialize sila sa mga rules na ito from birth dahil sa omnipresent na social expectations and instructions. In themselves, ang rules tulad ng heterosexuality or homosexuality ay hindi nag-represent ng stable na categories. For sila ay merely what people do. It is only by performing ang rules na ito ayon sa social expectations ay nagiging real or stable or meaningful ito. Ang notion ng discursive na construction, which is an idea na ang way a particular society talks about things ang naglegitimize dito, which make them seem self-evidently true, ay isang key understanding sa queer theory dahil it is through discursive construction ng mga role at expectation na ito ay created and perpetuated. Ang detached view ng gender ni Butler ay nag-follow kay Foucault dahil sa pag-describe nito of a vast social conspiracy na nag-play out intentionally and unwittingly. Ito ay common seems applied na postmodern theory. Nag-describe si Butler ng true gender identity ay isang regulatory na fiction na need ma-reveal. Ang regulatory fictions ng sex, gender, and sexuality ay maintained through gender performativity kung saan ay it contains ang strategy para itago ang nature ng gender performativity. Para kay Butler, ang mission ng queer theory at activism is to liberate ang performative na possibilities para mapalaganap ang mas wide na gender configurations na outside sa restricting na frames ng masculinist na domination and compulsory na heterosexuality. If ma-recognize raw natin ng gender ay performative, ay makita natin na it can be performed in ways na hindi ma-privilege ang masculine at heterosexual. Si Butler, tinirize niya ito by using in Deridian na notion ng phalogocentrism. Ito ang idea na ang social reality ay constructed by language na nag-privilege sa masculine. She also expands sa concept ni Adrian Rich na compulsory heterosexuality, which is where heterosexual heterosexuality ay taken as a natural na state of being at ang homosexuality ay seen to be a perversion para ma-enforce sa mga tao to be straight. Si Butler, though, ay hindi optimistic sa ability natin to disrupt ang mga alleged na hegemonic na discourses na ito. Ang paniniwala niya is that impossible to step outside ng social constructions na created by discourses. Ang pwede lang natin gawin is to trouble and disrupt them para magkaroon ng space ang mga tao na mag-fit in. Ang proposed na solution ni Butler sa problem na ito ay may malaking influence sa mga activists na nag-follow sa kanya. Butler advocated a politics of parody. Ang approach na ito attempts to subvert yung patterns ng gender performativity and in particular na tinitiri nito ay ang phalogocentrism and compulsory na heterosexuality. What they seek is to render absurd ang constant na repetition nila ng kanilang logic, metaphysics, and naturalized ontologies. Para ma-achieve ito, si Butler ay nag-advocate ng deliberate na subversive na repetition na pwede mag-put into question ng identity mismo. Ito ay sa pamamagitan ng conscious effort na isubvert ang traditional notions ng gender identity and gender role sa pag-employ ng drag or queer camp na aesthetic. Ang purpose nitong Butlerian na parody is to cause people to question ang assumptions kung saan ang performativity ay based para makita ng tao na social construct pala ito. And ultimately, ay arbitrary and oppressive siya. Ang point is to achieve ang liberation from these categories and also sa mga expectations that come with them. Si Judith Butler ay nag-advocate toward incoherence. Kung ay isang activist can make the incoherence ng categories ng sex, gender, and sexuality obvious and also ridiculous, 
din ang categories at oppression na they create will cease to be seen as meaningful. Persistent ang assertion ni Butler na she even calls into question whether ang biological sex ba could be considered as anything other than a cultural construct. Ang sabi niya sa gender trouble, quote, Uh, if the immutable character of sex is contested, perhaps this construct called sex is as culturally constructed as gender. Indeed, perhaps it was always already gender, with the consequence that the distinction between sex and gender turns out to be no distinction at all. End quote. Si Butler ay directly na chinalenge ang prevailing forms ng feminism by asking, kung ang construction ba ng category of women as a coherent and stable na subject ay unwitting na regulation ng gender relations. This means na ang pag-make natin ng woman as a real biological category ay may unintended consequences of creating a coherent and stable notion of what it means to be a human. Para kasi kay Butler, ang very existence ng coherent and stable na categories like a woman ay nag sa totalitarian and oppressive na discourses. Though most ng mga tao who find such a conclusion ridiculous, ang queer theory ay nag sa pag and subvert ng mga ganitong categories. Para kay Butler ay she describes ng pag ng isang tao sa isang category like gender na for them ay they don't feel na accurately ay this describes them ay isa itong violent na act. Para kay Butler ay ang activism at scholarship ay dapat i-disrupt ang mga ganitong discourses para ma-minimize ang harms na made by this violence. Uh, ngayon natapos na tayo kay Judith Butler. Let's now proceed kay Eve Kosofsky Sedgwick. Ang contributions ni Sedgwick sa queer theory are about sa pag sa temptations to resolve contradictions and also sa pag-find ng value sa plurality, which is ang pag-accept ng iba't ibang perspectives at once kahit sila ay mutually contradictory. Para kay Sedgwick ay useful ito for activism. Ang sabi niya sa epistemology of the closet ay, quote, In consonance with my emphasis on the performative relations of double and conflicted definition, the series prescription for a practical politics implicit in these readings is for a multi-pronged movement whose idealist and materialist impulses, whose minority model and universalist model strategies, and for that matter, whose gender separatist and gender integrative analyses would likewise proceed in parallel without any high premium placed on ideological rationalization between them. End quote. Dito, ang sinasabi ni Sedgwick na ang isang productive no- movement could incorporate lahat ng ideas na makikita sa LGBT scholarship and activism kahit ang mga mutually contradictory na approaches without ang effort to resolve ang ideological, difference ni- ideological differences nito. Ang argument ni Sedgwick ay ang contradictions daw ay politically valuable kasi it would make it hard for people to think about their activism which will make it hard to criticize. Sa book na ito ni Sedgwick ay dinevelop niyang view ni Foucault ng sexuality ay isang social construct na brought into being by scientific discourses, especially yung mga legitimized ng medical authorities na nag-classify sa homosexuality bilang psychopathology. Nevertheless, ay ibang view niya kay Foucault and mas nag siya kay Derrida. Universe kasi ni Sedgwick ang belief ni Foucault na ang dominant na discourses ang gumawa sa homosexuality and heterosexuality. And she argued instead ng binary ng homosexuality and heterosexuality ang nagbigay sa atin ng binary thinking na ang mga tao ay either gay or straight, male or female, masculine or feminine. Para kay Sedgwick, ay ang basis ng lahat ng social binaries ay ang sexual binaries. Now, let's continue sa symbolism ni Sedgwick of the closet. Ang symbolism na ito ay predicated sa idea ng false binaries. Ang tara o raw is never fully in or out of the closet. Some people will know the one sexuality and others will not. Some things will be said and others will not. Ang may knowledge to begin for both Uh, and my knowledge to begin for both from what has been said and hasn't. Ang closet para kay Sedgwick ay therefore nagsimbolize ng pag-occupy ng contradicting na realities at the same time. Ayon kay Pluckers and Lindsay, ang pag-embrace rito at ang pag-make nito visible ay course approach ni Sedgwick sa queer theory. Dahil Sedgwick 
took the postmodernist approach as she identifies language as the way kung paano constructed ang unjust na binaries at kung paano ang close set ay constructed and maintained. Para sa kanya, ay ang theoretical approach niya ay potentially revelatory at free. Ang sabi niya sa Epistemology of the Closet, quote, An assumption underlying the book is that the relations of the closet, the relations of the known and the unknown, the explicit and the inexplicit around the homo or heterosexual definition have the potential for being peculiarly revealing, in fact, about speech acts more generally, end quote. Ang relations na ito ayon kay Sedgwick ay in need of deconstruction. She emphasizes na may analysis na nag-recognize ng homosexuality ay inferior sa heterosexuality. Pero ang term na heterosexuality ay hindi, nag, ay hindi mag-exist kung ang homosexuality ay hindi category of difference. Ang observation na ito is meant to deconstruct yung power relationship sa binary by highlighting na dahil ang concept ng heterosexuality ay dependent sa existence sa existence and subordinated status ng homosexuality, it cannot be said to have a priority status. And dahil dito ay Sedgwick seeks to deconstruct ang heteronormativity, which is a widespread na expectation ng heterosexuality ang normal and default. She finds it useful to generalize sa understanding ng binaries ng sexuality sa ibang binary sa society para madestabilize yung hierarchies ng superiority and inferiority. Dahil dito ay thoroughly deridian si Sedgwick. Tulad ng ibang deridian thinkers, ay this leads her to highlight and exploit ang nakikita niya na tension na nag from holding two seemingly contradictory views at the same time. Sa sexuality, ang views na ito para kay Sedgwick ay ang minoritizing view and ang universalizing view. Sa minoritizing view, ang homosexual ay seen as something that minority of people are. Tapos ang majority ay seen as heterosexual. Ang universalizing view naman si sexuality as a spectrum kung saan ay lahat ng tao ay may place. This means na lahat ng tao ay little bit or a lot gay. Though this may seem contradictory, a productive ito para kay Sedgwick sa politics. Now, uh, tapos na tayo yung talking about by power ni Foucault. We also talked about yung views ng main proponents ng queer theory. So ngayon, we'll now proceed in making a biblical critique of, of queer theory. First, Let's talk about human nature. Sa Bible, it affirms that we are all made in the image of God. This means na bawat aspect ng humanity natin reflects who God is. Sa Bible ay true ito both of male and female. Ang sabi sa Genesis 1.27 ay, God, So God created mankind in His own image. In the image of God, He created them. Male and female, He created them. Ang threefold na repetition ito sa book of Genesis profoundly shows na essential sa identity natin as human beings ang pagiging male at female. In the same way na essential sa nature natin ang pagiging made in the image of God. This does not mean though na like us having eyes and ears, ay God literally has eyes and ears na. Sa body kasi natin being made in God's image ay God sees or hears kahit not in the same way as us. Ganon din sa sexuality natin. It mirrors God pero not in the same way. We can see ang capability ng male and female to procreate sa kanilang union ay nagpoint sa creativity ni God na he himself can bring forth sons and daughters. Ang love ng husband and wife could be said to reflect God's love for his people. But this does not mean that God is either male or female or both when we say na ang image of God ay male and female. In actuality, ang creation sa Genesis 1 shows a different message. Polemic kasi ito against false gods and sa ancient Near Eastern na pagan mythology kasi ay lahat ay nag-came into being dahil sa sexual union ng male and female ng gods. Pero sa Bible, we see na God created sexual differences na He transcends it. Sabi nga ni Richard Davidson sa Flame of Yahweh, sexuality in the Old Testament ay ang sexual distinctions ay presented as God's creation and not part of the divine realm. For this reason, ay mali rin for people to say na transgender or gender fluid si God kasi God transcends male and female. Now, uh, why do we mention this in our discussions sa queer theory? Kasi if this is true, then we can say na maraming bagay sa queer theory that is contrary to scripture. 
One example ay ang assessment ni Sedgwick ng existence ng heterosexuality ay dependent sa existence ng homosexuality as a category of difference. Theologically kasi ay everything that God created is good and ang sin and everything evil sa world ay corruption. This means na hindi dependent ang good sa evil in the same way that walang evil na divine being na nag-exist alongside God in eternity. Si God lang ang nag-exist. This means ng heterosexuality ay mag-exist if hindi mangyari ang fall of man kasi hindi siya dependent sa existence niya sa homosexuality. Another example ay ang view ng queer series ng sex, gender, and sexuality should be seen as social constructs. Though to a degree it could be said na certain parts ng gender and sexuality could be deemed as social constructs, may disagreement na sex, gender, and sexuality as a whole should be seen as social constructs. Also, aside from the Christian worldview, affirming na sex is biological, uh, one thing na we can expound dito ay ang na-mention ni Pluck, Rose, and Lindsay ng gender is correlated with sex. Si Greg Johnson ay may writing about the biological basis for gender-specific behavior. First, he talked about the isological observations sa sex. Ang isologists ay mga students of animal and human behavior na nag-generalize ng social behavior across animal and human groups. What they found out is that among mammals, ang males tend to build hierarchical social order and mas reactive sila and less cautious. Involved sila sa pag-break away ng mga lesser rank na males and also females and juveniles. Sila rin ay nag-set ng directions and courses of actions for the group as a whole. Ang females naman ay mas involved sa parenting dahil sa close dependence ng infant sa maternal milk supply. Ang females sa most groups na studied ay hindi driven by competitive, territorial, at hierarchical na urges. And they tend to socialize more horizontally and equally with other females. Cautious sila sa pag-mate and they show interest sa males na nag-show ng dominance and control ng most resources. Ang females naman ay mas concerned with parenting, nurturing, nurturing and maintaining pair bonds with mates through grooming or caregiving behaviors. And they tend sa broader na social contacts nila to be less confrontive and combative at mas interested sila sa pag-build and maintain ng social bonds. Sila ay mga conformists at peacemakers sa expectations ng group. Ang mga anthropologists find similar kinds ng universal na sex-specific behaviors ng human culture. Greg Johnson noted sa nasa 250 cultures na studied ay ang male ang mostly nagdominate. Sila mostly ang rule makers, hunters, builders, fashioners ng weapons, workers sa uh, metal, wood, and stone. Tapos ang women ay primarily caregivers na involved sa child rearing. Ang activities nila ay nakasenter sa care and maintenance ng home and family. So sila ay often seen as making pottery, baskets, clothes, and blankets. Sila ang nag-gather, preserve, and prepare ng food. Sila ang nag-obtain and carry ng firewood and water. Sila ang nag-collect at grind ng grain. Ang fact ng uni- na ang universals na ito transcends divergent animal groups at cultures suggest na there must be more than a cultural basis sa sex differences na ito. And indeed, may sex-related differences tayo na makita sa biology. Si Greg Johnson talked about differences sa nervous system physiology, peripheral nervous system, limbic system, cerebral organization, sex differences at birth, and sex differences in, in stress management. Uh, so let's share one category which is ang non-nervous system physiology. Ang conventional view raw sa sexual development presented sa psychosocial literature through the 60s at 80s is that apart from the morphological and physiological differences na essential for reproduction, ay ang men and women ay essentially the same sa potentials and capacities. At ang behavioral differences daw ay reflections ng culturally imposed norms. Ang biological profile ng male and female, however, ay nagpapakita ng maraming basic na physiological differences and marami rito ay nag-shape ng behavior. Ang basal metabolic rate ay 6% higher sa adolescent boys than girls and, it, and increases to about 10% higher after puberty. During metabolism ay ang girls convert more energy into stored fat while boys convert more energy to muscle and expendable circulating reserves. 
at age 18, ang mga girls have almost twice the body fat, which is about 33% compared sa boys. Ang boys sa age 18 have 50% more muscle mass than girls, particularly sa upper body. Ang males on the average have denser and stronger bones, tendons, and ligaments na nag-allow for them to do heavier work. Ang differences nila sa metabolism and muscular ability likely gives males a push sa more energetic na direction. Ang males have more sweat glands and they can dissipate heat faster than females. Ang women ay mas sicker ang layer nila ng subcutaneous fat na nag-act as insulation and energy reserve. They also can withstand cold better and have better energy supply for activities na nag-require ng matinding endurance. And women ay may raised na performance sa long distance swimming, running, and endurance sports. Ang males naman ay nag ng significant na advantage sa sports na nag-require ng short bursts of strength tulad ng sprints. Ang men on the average ay may larger na windpipes at branching na bronchi at 30% greater ang lang lung capacity nila. Ang men ay relatively mas malaki ang hearts and can pump a larger blood volume. Ang males ay 10% higher and red blood cell counts, higher, higher hemoglobin readings, at higher na oxygen carrying capacity. Sila ay may higher na circulating na clotting factors tulad ng vitamin K, thrombin, at platelets. Ang rap, rapid na clotting nila and higher basal metabolic rate leads to more rapid healing of wounds at bruises. Ang males ay may fewer na sensory nerve endings sa skin and higher na pain tolerance. Ang combination ng traits na ito ay pwede mag-aid sa males to be encouraged na mas maging active to be risk takers. Ang women naman on the average, they have more stored and circulating na white blood cells. They have more granulocytes and BNT lymphocytes to fight infection. They produce more antibodies faster and dahil doon ay they have a more effective na response to infectious invaders. They respond then mas few na infectious diseases. Ay, I mean, they develop then mas few na infectious diseases and succumb to them for shorter periods of time. Dahil dito, ang mga isologists argue ng females na nag-care for multiple offspring and na nag interact with other females and their offspring sa kanilang social groups kung saan ay ang communicable diseases ay madali ma-spread ay this shows na particularly advantageous for women ang kanilang biological characteristics. Sa males naman ay less historically involved sila sa ganitong activities pero as involved sila sa hunting, protection, building, war, etc. where we see na more in need sila ng good wound healing na system. Ang conclusion niya dito is that ang fundamental na physiological and neural differences natin na present at birth ay nagpredispose atin towards certain behaviors na dependent on gender. This does not necessarily mean that we should conclude na we should conclude na based sa different gifts ng men and women ay traditional rule traditional rules na ang only way it could be expressed. Ang point lang is that though culture has changed, ang physiological differences natin ay hindi. And this should make us understand each other more and maximize the potential natin as male and female. This should help us resist pressures to become what we are not. Based dito sa conclusion ni Greg Johnson, we can say that there's good support sa view na ang gender ay correlated sa sex. And dahil dito, we cannot really affirm the same as queer theorists na social construct on sex, gender, and sexuality. Based sa backdrop na ito, I, we will proceed to the next aspect of our critique. Second, we can argue that queer theorists and dangers instead of helping among the people that they seek to help. If we have stable na categories such as female, and we cannot answer ontologically what it means to be a woman, then we don't have exist na woman na oppressed. It would not make sense for us to say that women do not have equal access politically as men on certain countries or that women do not have equal opportunities career-wise career if there is no such thing as men and women. It will be harder for us to categorize diseases that must prevail in women to, to help women if there is no such thing as women. It will also be hard for us to collect data about women that being victimized on a particular aspects of society so social science 
if a category such a woman does not exist talaga in reality. Ganon din ang mangyayari if walang stable category of what it means to be a gay, lesbian, or bisexual. If gusto kasi natin matulungan ang mga minorities like them in a society, mas madali to make public policies that serve them if we can easily get data sa pagkategorize natin sa kanila. If illusion lang kasi ang category ng pagiging gay, then it would not make sense to say na minority sila and that majority ang heterosexuals. Based dito, we can see na having stable categories could be seen as well as something na pwede makatulong and serve a certain group of people instead of oppressing them. If we know kasi who are gay, for example, then we can study and know anong types of injustices bang nararanasan nila. This can help us get objective data na pwede natin magamit to make policies that serve them. Dahil all humans are made in the image of God and therefore are equal to sa inherent value and worth, then regardless if male or female, straight or part ng LGBT, ayong universal na human nature natin makes us deserve certain rights na hindi pwede sa atin kunin ng government. Third, hindi enough to derive ang view kay Foucault and assume ng science ay isang enemy. Just because science are used historically to justify racisms, ay it does not automatically mean ang science as a discipline ay oppressive. The existence of bad science does not negate ang good science. We have all benefited sa advancement ng science. The advent of the internet could be argued to be a force for evil, where we can also argue na it could be a force of good. Dahil dito, instead of having an unhealthy cynicism ng science ng walang evidence, if someone has a specific contention na certain people are being oppressed at ang science ay being weaponized to justify oppression, it is not good to just assume it. Evidence must be presented like kung sinong people bang oppressed and how is science ba being weaponized to oppress them para it will be easier for us to make rectifications for their good. Fourth, It seems that the idea nila to embrace contradictory views activism is more of a more of a ploy to avoid criticism. For me, it seems to be manipulative and dishonest. And dahil dito ay we have a good reason to doubt the good na pwede makontribute ng kanilang movement. The truth kasi can stand to reverse scrutiny. To add, ang kanilang political strategy is not really a good strategy. Though it could be harder for other people to pin pinpoint kung ano ba talaga ang kanilang view, there are people na mas masipag to examine worldviews which could discern what they are doing. And dahil contradictory ang views sa kanilang movement, ay mas madali for people to show ang self-contradictory na notions nila about sexuality. In summary, we talked about yung general introduction about queer theory, yung historical background nito, and we expanded on sa views ng main proponents nito. Lastly, we gave a critique on Queer theory from a Christian standpoint. Now, tapos na tayo and we can now proceed sa ating Q&A.